Good evening and welcome to the Spirit and Life Bible Study. Our topic tonight is Freedom and Consequences, a core message of the Bible. I want to set this up a little bit just to say that um, it's amazing uh, that this idea of freedom and consequences uh, is, is interestingly under assault. You know, some people believe that there is no freedom, that everything's just determined, and there's a lot of thought about, well, you can have free choice, but you don't necessarily have to have the consequences of your choices. And so that's what we'll be exploring in a nutshell tonight. And can I invite you to join me in a prayer? Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we thank you for bringing us together, Lord, in your name. You are the Word made flesh, the door to the sheepfold, the one God of heaven and earth. We pray for insight, Lord, into core messages in your Word. Amen. Amen. So, uh, some, some weeks I get a, um, a, a, a visual sort of thing. Sometimes it's, it's verbal, different ideas that come to me for Bible study. But this week was definitely visual, and I thought I'd show that to you right away. Um, it's a very simple diagram that I'll describe for people who have the audio or on the phone, that you basically have uh, squares in four corners, four squares. In the lower left, you have a square that reads evil acts, and then the upper left, you have a square that reads death, comma, curses. And there's many strong lines tying those two boxes together on the left. The way I've got them on my chart, they're in black on the chart. And then on the right, the lower left, the, the, low, the lower right is, is in red and it says good acts. And the upper right says life, comma, and blessings. And those two things are very strongly connected together. Uh, but there, there's no connection going sideways. And down at the bottom, I have the word freedom with an arrow to the left and an arrow to the right. That we're free to choose, and this sort of summarizes what I see as a core message of Scripture, that we're free to choose to do evil, and then there are consequences of doing evil, or we're free to do good, and there are consequences of doing good. Uh, but this seems to me a, a really fundamental um, message of Scripture, and uh, I, I, I will probably get back to this in a bit, but I realized in meditating on this that uh, for much of my life, uh, my lower self and it, perhaps your lower self, I hope not, but perhaps your lower self has said the same thing to you. What I've most fervently wanted, the top of my Christmas list of wishes, was to be able to do evil and not have consequences. <laughs> that I, I want, you know, what I want for Christmas is to be able to do something, do what I want to do, do whatever I want to do, and then pray really hard that those actions are not attached to any consequence, especially after I've done something. You know, and this can be something as humble, it may not be about good or evil, but it can be something as humble as, you know, when, when uh, I don't know, you know, you've had too much to drink, and then you, you pray that you don't have a hangover, <laughs> um, you know, or you eat the wrong thing that always gives you a headache or something, and then you eat the wrong thing, and then you pray that you don't get a headache. <laughs> you know, and um, it's just not the way that the Word lays it out. You know, the Word lays it out that the, y you have freedom to choose from the left column or the right column. You have, to, you have total freedom. Nobody's stopping you from doing whatever you want to do down here. Uh, but the Word says, just understand that this is associated with certain consequences and this is associated with certain consequences. You know, the doing of evil or the doing of good. Now, uh, it gets tricky, though, in terms of this world, because often we do things, uh, you know, we certainly see people doing evil things in the world and seemingly being rewarded sometimes. Uh, you see people doing good things, and sometimes they get punished. No good deed will go unpunished, they say, and so on. Uh, so it doesn't always work out in, in this world. 
By the way, I'll read you these words that are on here. That uh, I think the quintessential phrase in Scripture that deals with this is not the only phrase, but it's if then. The if is freedom, right? If you do this or whatever, or if you don't do it, you know. But the then is the consequence. If this, then this. If this, then this. And uh, I realized on the good side, another way that Scripture expresses this, and we'll be looking at this, is that you'll get a command, like the one I have in mind is in the New Testament, where it says, do this and you will live. And I like that word and, because it shows that these are connected. The and shows very specifically, do this and you will live. You know, those are connected. And what I've written over here is ineluctable consequences. The word ineluctable is a magnificent 10, perhaps even a $12 word. It uh, comes from a Latin root that means cannot be wrestled out of. Uh, they are consequences that you cannot wriggle your way out of. They're ineluctable consequences. You know, they're, they're very definite consequences. And yet, what I've written on here with evil acts at the bottom and death and curses at the top, but we've, we've done evil and we didn't die. And, and it says good, and it says life. Uh, like, what, what does that mean? What is scripture talking about? And I'll be uh, presenting the idea that this is really talking about in the spiritual, this is spiritually true. This doesn't always happen this way in the physical world, but it's, but it's spiritually true. Uh, let's start reading some fun stuff. Uh, let's start in Genesis, shall we? All the way to the left of the book. Let's look at chapter 2 in Genesis and um, and have a look at uh, verses 15 to 17. This is the Garden of Eden. You may be familiar with it. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. Of every tree of the garden you may <coughs> freely eat. Isn't that a very clear statement of freedom? And any tree, every tree, you may freely eat. But there's, a, there's another word that comes after that. What's but. That? But. Oh, there's a but. <laughs> of every tree in the garden you may freely eat. But. What? Of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. Okay, you shall not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's a command, right? You shall not eat of the tree of good and knowledge of good and evil. Why not? For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Oh, okay. Well, here's our little chart with evil acts on the left and, uh, and good acts on the right. And you're free to eat from any tree in the garden. Any tree whatsoever. But there's one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You shall not eat of it, which is a command. But it says... In the day that you eat of it, now, you see that that makes it clear that this command is not like the law of gravity or something, right? Uh, the law of gravity just says, you know, people who jump off of bridges never fly up in the air. You know, uh, it, there's a definite ineluctable consequence of jumping off a bridge. Uh, but this is saying, don't eat that tree. If you do, this is what will happen. You know, so it's obviously possible. It's on the menu. You know, it's possible to eat from the tree. It, it, the Lord is just saying, don't do that. And why not? Because in the day that you eat of it, so I'm evil acts down on the bottom, and then what are the consequences? Death, right? In the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Now, we've talked about this story before sometimes in Bible study. Do, do, do Adam and Eve, do they end up eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Mm -hmm. Yes. And do they die? No. They continue to live. They get thrown out of the garden. There is a consequence. But they don't physically keel over dead as soon as they eat the fruit. You would think, from what he just said, with that they eat the fruit, ah, oh, they die. And, and that's it. Uh, and he said, in, in that very day, you know, in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. But they don't die, but it's got to be talking about a spiritual death, right? Uh, because they, they get not only 
driven out of the Garden of Eden, but there's an angel guardian that stands there, a cherubim that, that protects the way so that they can't you know, come back in and so on. They're blocked from it, and there are all these curses that go along with it. Death and curses. So it's right in the beginning of the Bible. You do something evil, disobey the Lord, death and curses is what will result. And yet already we get the sense that there's, there's something spiritual about what it's saying because they don't go through physical death. They go through a spiritual death. They, they go through something much worse than physical death, actually. Let's look in Genesis chapter 4, verse 7. This is about Cain and Abel, and this is the <laughs> Lord talking to Cain. If you do well, will you not be accepted? There's an if. There's an if and an implied then, isn't there? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door. Okay. Simple choice, right? Very straightforward. You can do something good and you'll be accepted because those things are, are connected to each other. If you do something evil, sin lies at the door. It's, it's, you can't get out of it. it. It's just a consequence of the fact of, of, um, of doing that. Okay, am I making sense? Mm -hmm. Let's turn to the right to Deuteronomy, okay? And let's go to chapter 28. One of my favorite chapters in Scripture. It's very, very grisly chapter. <laughs> and uh, it is Moses communicating with the children of Israel the blessings and the curses. So we're talking about the consequences up here. And the freedom, the implied freedom. Mm, very interesting. All right. Okay, let's, let's start reading in here. We're not going to read all 68 verses. Uh, you may notice, if you look carefully, that there are 14 verses of blessings and 54 <laughs> verses of curses. Okay. And we won't read all of them, but let's, <coughs> let's, let's make a good head start here. At the top. At the top. Now it shall come to pass if... Oh, there's that word. If. <coughs> right? If implies freedom. Scripture is full of if, right? If this, this, is the, this is a fundamental message of the Old Testament. It shall come to pass, if you do what? If you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all his commandments, which I command you today, that the Lord your God will set you high above all nations of the earth. Okay, that'll be a blessing. You'll be set high above all nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. Right. Because it's an ineluctable consequence, a consequence that cannot be struggled out of, that if you do these things, all these good things will happen as a result because you were obedient. Go on. Blessed shall you be in the city and blessed shall you be in the country. Hmm. Blessed shall be the fruit of your body, the produce of your ground, and the increase of your herds, the increase of your cattle, and the offspring of your flocks. Wow. If you follow the Lord's commandments, your cattle will do well. That's what it says, right? Right? Mm -hmm. The fruit of your body, the crops that come out of the ground, your cattle will do, will do very well. The flocks and so forth, they will increase if you do what is good. Now, is that, is that literally true? I don't actually own any cattle. I'm embarrassed to say it. <laughs> I, I don't own a single sheep or anything. So maybe I've been very, very bad. I don't know. But I haven't had any increase in cattle as a result of uh, <laughs> trying to follow the Lord. But I don't think this is speaking physically. I think so much, friends, you know this, that, that, that the, the word is, is describing spiritual world. It's describing the afterlife. It's describing things that we cannot otherwise see. That's why it's a revelation. So it uses earthly terms like cattle and sheep. And yet we look around us and it's very, very obvious that there are people who are following the Lord who, you know, have sickly cattle <laughs> and lame sheep, you know? And there are people who are evil who have wonderful, sleek, <laughs> gleaming cattle and, and fabulous, healthy, four-legged sheep. <laughs> Go on. 
<laughs> Blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Blessed shall you be when you come in, and blessed shall you be when you go out. Mm. The Lord will cause your enemies who rise against you to be defeated before your face. They shall come out against you one way and flee before you seven ways. Yes, and let's skip down to verse 11. This is all just wonderful stuff. But And the Lord will grant you plenty of goods in the fruit of your body, in the increase of your livestock, there it is again. and in the produce of your ground, mm. in the land of which the Lord swore to your fathers to give you. The Lord will open to you his good treasure, the heavens, to give the rain to your land in its season. What? And to give if you live, if you live well, your average annual rainfall will increase. <laughs> That's what it said, right? If you live well, the Lord will open to you His good treasure, and the heaven will give rain to your land. So you will get more rain if you do well. There's a direct consequence. There's a good act, and you will get blessing. You will get life and blessings, and one of those blessings will be more rain. Go on. To bless all the work of your hand. You shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. Yes. You will not have a trade deficit if you live well. Go on. And the Lord will make you the head and not the tail. Oh, that's good. You shall be above <laughs> only and not be be beneath. I hate being the tail. <laughs> uh, and not be beneath if you heed. If. 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 You heed the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today, and are careful to observe them. Yeah. So, sh so you shall not turn aside from any of the words which I command you this day, to the right or the left, to go after other gods to serve them. Yeah, now it fascinates me that people think that you could read this in a physical way, uh, that if you obeyed the Lord you would get more rainfall and more flocks and so forth. But this is talking about spiritual blessings, isn't it? It's, it's so obvious to me uh, that the cattle are good emotions, you know, love for the neighbor or <coughs> hope or peace and things like that. The rain is truth and insight, you know, flowing down into your mind, understanding and so forth. Those are the things that the Lord will give you if you're doing good things. They're spiritual blessings that it's talking about. So, verse 15. So we read our 14, you know, we read some of the 14 verses of the blessings. But, 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 but always a but there's an if there's a then there's a but <laughs> and then there's another if and then another then but it shall come to pass if, if you do not obey the voice of the Lord your God uh -huh. to observe carefully all his commandments and his statutes which I command you today that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you oh tell me about that <coughs> cursed shall you be in the city and cursed shall you be in the country Cursed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Cursed shall be the <coughs> fruit of your body and the produce of your land, the increase of your cattle and the offspring of your flocks. Yes, so your flocks will not do well if you do evil things. Cursed shall you be when you come in and cursed shall you be when you go out. Ah, and listen to this. Listen to this next verse. The Lord will send on you cursing confusion and rebuke in all that you set your hand to do. So you will not be successful. Until what point? Until you are destroyed. Wow, until you are destroyed. And until you perish quickly. Quickly, you quickly perish because until of you're destroyed and perish quickly. <laughs> Why? Because of the wickedness of your doings. Oh, so this is, you did evil things, you're getting curses. And it, it's even to the point of being destroyed. Okay? Now, let's look at verse 22. The Lord will strike you with consumption, with fever, with inflammation, with severe burning Ooh. fever, with a sword, with scorching, and with mildew. And they shall pursue you until you perish. Until you perish again. You already perished in verse 20. <laughs> right? You were destroyed and you perished quickly in verse 20. And in verse 22, you will perish again. Look at verse 24. The Lord will change the rain of your land to powder and dust. Ooh, no rain. The amount of average rainfall you get will decrease. You'll get powder and dust. 
From the heaven it shall come down on you until you are destroyed. Until you are destroyed again. Third time. You've been destroyed three times already by three different things. Mm. Okay. And uh, let's see, you'll get the itch, which you cannot be healed from. You'll get madness in verse 28 and blindness, astonishment of the heart. And uh, no one will save you at the end of verse 29. Oh, let's look at verse 33. A nation whom you have not known shall eat the fruit of your land and the produce of your labor. And you shall be only oppressed and crushed continually. Oh, okay, you'll be destroyed You'll perish quickly, you'll be destroyed, you'll be destroyed, and you'll be crushed <laughs> all the time. Okay, uh, let's have a look at verse 35, just because it's fun. The Lord will strike you in the knees oh. and on the legs oh. with severe boils which cannot be healed, mm. and from the sole of your foot to the top of your head. Now, does this literally happen? You know, shoplifting, and then suddenly you get a boil on your knee? <laughs> It doesn't quite work that way, does it? In the physical world, it doesn't, it doesn't work that way. And yet this is what the Word is saying, and so it's got to be true at some level. Okay. Uh, oh, let's have a look here. Uh, let's look at verse f uh, 40 f uh, 44. He shall lend to you... Oh, this is the stranger that's, that's in your midst. Okay. He shall lend to you, but you shall not lend to him. Oh, you'll have a massive trade deficit. He shall be the head, and you shall be the tail. Oh. <laughs> Moreover, all these curses shall come upon you and pursue and overtake you. Until what? Until you are destroyed. Until you are destroyed. <laughs> because you did not obey the voice of the Lord your God to keep his commandments and his statutes which he commanded you. Okay, let's look at verse 48. Therefore you shall serve your enemies whom the Lord will send against you in hunger, in thirst, in nakedness, and in need of everything. And he will put a yoke of iron on your neck. Until what? Until he has destroyed you. Until he's you. destroyed you! What are we up to, five or six or something? We've been destroyed six or seven times here. Uh, 51. And they shall eat the increase of your livestock and the produce of your land. Until what? Until you are Until destroyed. you're destroyed! How many times can you be destroyed? Seems kind of unrealistic, doesn't it? <laughs> At least Go seven, on. I bet. They shall not leave you grain or new wine or oil or the increase of your cattle or the offspring until what? of your flocks until they have destroyed until you. Until they've destroyed you. <coughs> hmm. Yes, okay, how about verse 61? Uh, verse 60. Moreover, he will bring back on you all the diseases of Egypt of which you were afraid, wow. and they shall cling to you. Oh, even though you've been destroyed seven or eight times and you've perished and you've been crushed forever, these, th you'll still be alive enough to have diseases cling to you. <laughs> okay, go on. Also, every sickness and every plague which is not written in this book of the law will the Lord bring upon you until, until what? you are destroyed. Until you are destroyed, yes. You shall be left few in number, whereas you were as the stars of heaven in multitude. Wow, so you're going to reduce in number. Very <coughs> interesting. There used to be many of you, like the stars of heaven. Now there's going to be very few. Why? Because you would not obey the voice of the Lord your God. This is a consequence of disobedience. Tell me more. And it shall be that just as the Lord rejoiced over you to do you good and multiply you, so the Lord will rejoice over you to destroy oh. you. And bring you to nothing. Ow. And you shall be plucked from off the land which you go to possess. Yes, okay. And, um, oh, let's have a look at verse 66. That's a cheerful one. Your life shall hang in doubt before you. Mm. You shall fear day and night and have no assurance of life. <coughs> in the morning you shall say, oh, that it were evening. And at evening you shall say, oh, that it were morning. So you'll have a little problem being in the moment. <laughs> because of the fear which terrifies your heart and because of the sight which your eyes see. And what is the end of all these curses? And the Lord will take you back to Egypt. In back ships. to Egypt again. In ships, by the way of which I said to you, you shall never see it again. 
And, and there you shall be offered for sale to your enemies. You'll be offered to say, but, you know, for sale to your enemies and... As male and female slaves. And... But no one will buy you. No one will buy you. <laughs> so you're going to be destroyed, 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 pressed, you know, crushed, <laughs> destroyed again, destroyed again, and then I'll put you in a ship and ship you back to Egypt and put you up for sale and no one will buy you. <laughs> That's what you're going to get if you disobey the Lord. It's so awesome, isn't it? It's just awesome. But we do evil when these things don't apparently happen. You know, not in a literal way. This scripture does not seem to be literally fulfilled in every way. Occasionally we have the odd boil on the knee, but, but it doesn't seem to be directly connected with our moral life, necessarily. And... Um, Wow. But that is quite a statement of, you know, so, you see where I'm coming from? It seems to me that Scripture is saying, you have freedom. Both of these things are very much on the menu. But what I want you to understand is if you do these good things over here, you will get life and blessings. Your animals will do well, you'll get rain, you'll, you will be lending to other people, you won't be in debt and all that. You're perfectly free to, to choose to disobey the Lord. You're perfectly free to do that. Nobody's going to stop you from doing that. I just need you to know that that has consequences and that they are bad. You know, you're, you're going to feel terrible and uh, it'll be a kind of repeated death. It's, it's fascinating, isn't it, from the standpoint of the idea of an eternal life uh, in hell, you know, it's fascinating from the standpoint of the idea that you'll be destroyed and destroyed and destroyed and destroyed. You, you know, this ongoing destruction, and yet you still live and you're still conscious and you're still doing things and so on, even though it keeps emphasizing that you're destroyed. I don't want to get into all the controversy about the, the eternity of the hells or not and so on, but I just think it's very interesting, uh, that idea. I think it's talking about spiritual things, spiritual blessings and spiritual curses. Um, but do we experience these things? Mm, it's so clear, isn't it? It's so clear. You've got the freedom here, do this, and this will happen. And to repeat myself again, I think that what we do with this chart all the time, there are two things that I think are really fundamental uh, that we do with this chart. One is to say, well, there is no freedom. For some reason, this is such an attractive idea in philosophy. You know, it's people just love this idea that's deterministic and that you have no freedom. Swedenborg tells this hilarious experience that he witnessed in the spiritual world of all these people who believed that there was no freedom. And uh, they, were, they were all, they were, they're sitting around, they're having a debate. And the people would just spontaneously jump up and rush into the middle of the room and say, there's no freedom whatsoever. And then they'd go sit down. And then another one would just spontaneously dash into the middle of the room and say, there's no freedom whatsoever. And they're all acting completely freely and spontaneously <laughs> saying how there's no freedom. You know, it, it, it's fascinating. Um, so philosophy and, and, and so many things have said, well, it's just deterministic, you know, it's just your genes or you're just, you know, you're predisposed to certain something and you can't help it and there it is, you know, nothing you can do about it. Uh, I, I think at some level, you know, we love the idea of freedom so much in a certain way, but in other ways we're kind of uncomfortable with the idea that we just made a choice. You know, certainly if it was a if it was if if we did something evil, we would rather do anything than just say, I just made a choice. I love it. I saw the consequences. I decided to do it. You know, that's very, very seldom the way that people approach the doing of evil. They say, well, I, you know, there was this this burning desire, this urge, or you know, I couldn't get it out of my head, or you know, or or, or whatever. My my parents did this, or my grandparents did that, or or what? You know, we've we got some story about it, uh, but we're not willing to just say, no, I just I just chose this. And then once we've chosen it, we're praying to have a different outcome. You know, just praying that it not. How much do we do that? The lower self does this. I think certainly my lower self does this a lot. To think, well, I don't want the and and then you get the headache or you get you know the <laughs> the thing that was inevitably going to happen happens, and then you and then you even feel at a certain level like the Lord doesn't love you. You know, 
because I mean all you did was go out and have 13 beers and then you got this hangover you know and and you prayed about it you didn't want to have the hangover but you prayed about it and then you got a hangover so the Lord doesn't doesn't love you but actually when you stand back from it, there's so much love in this picture of freedom but consequences you know freedom you're free to do this but just understand it's linked to this and we are always saying well could I have <coughs> I, I want this from column A, I want evil acts from column A, and good consequences from column B. What I would really like is I'd like to be able to sleep around and have a good marriage. That's, that's what I would, you know, that's my goal. Or I would like to be a nasty, ruthless person who is much loved <laughs> by others. You know, that, that's what I would like. We, we have a lot of these little things where it just, you know, that, that's what I want. I, I don't want, I don't like this consequence thing here where these things are connected. Let's have a look at Ezekiel 18. So turn to the right, get into the prophets here. So it's Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 18 is another one that we've gone to a number of times in this Bible study. I just love it so much. And again, we probably don't have time to read the whole thing, but it's so wonderful. It talks about consequences. Okay, let's have a look at... Uh, let's start at um, verse 4 in Ezekiel 18. Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the Father as well as the soul of the Son is mine. <coughs> the soul who sins shall die. Ah, same message, isn't it? The, s the soul of the sin sinner shall die. Go on. But if... A but if... But if... Those are some of our favorite words tonight. But if... If a man is just and does what is lawful and right, if he has not eaten on the mountains, <coughs> nor lifted up his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel nor defiled his neighbor's wife, nor approached a woman during her impurity, if he has not oppressed anyone, but has restored to the debtor his pledge, has, ro has robbed no one by violence, but has given his bread to the hungry and covered the naked with clothing, if he has not exacted usury, nor taken any increase, but has withdrawn his hand from iniquity... Oh, what a wonderful phrase! withdrawn his hand from iniquity. Isn't that about what you're doing? Like you were tempted to do something, but you withdrawn your hand from iniquity. So you didn't do that evil thing. Go on. And executed true judgment between man and man. If he has walked in my statutes and kept my judgments faithfully, he, he is, is just. just. He shall surely live. Ah, says he's the just. God. He shall surely live. So it has yeah. consequences doing good things has consequences on the type of person you are and whether you quote unquote live or not. That person shall live. Okay, now what about the next generation? Uh, if, if he begets a son who is a robber mm. or a shedder of blood, Ooh. who does any of these things and does none of those duties, but and then et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and does all these bad things. And in verse 13, if he has exacted usury or taken increase, shall he then live? He shall not live. Oh, he shall not live. Evil acts are connected with death. You know, he shall not live. If he has done any of these abominations, he shall surely die. His blood shall be upon him. Okay. If, however, he begets a son who sees all the sins which his father has done, and considers, but does not do likewise. Ah, okay, so now we're <coughs> to the third generation. And if he sees what his father did, and considers and thinks, I don't want to be like that, and he does not do all those bad things, and it lists them again, right? Mm-hmm. And lists them, lists them, lists them at the end of uh, verse 17. But has executed my judgments and walked in my statutes, he shall not die for the iniquity of his father, he shall surely live. Okay, so it's individual responsibility. The first generation could be good, and that will lead to, to life. The next generation may be evil, and that will lead to death. The goodness of the previous generation won't help that individual who's doing evil, because the evil acts and the death, whatever death means there, 
are connected. It's a spiritual death. And, but if that evil person has a child, so in other words, you know, if you're the child of some evil person, uh, you can't blame that person for mm -hmm. whether you go to heaven or hell. That's what I'm hearing in here. You know, okay. it's up. It's up. To you, you're, you're perfectly. You have freedom. You can go to either of these situations here. Uh, go on. As for his father, because he cruelly oppressed, robbed his brother by violence, and did what is not good among his people, behold, he shall die for his iniquity. Yes, <coughs> and so it goes on about that, and it says at the end of verse 20, The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. Isn't that what we've got charted here? Evil acts, there's a consequence. Good acts, there's a consequence. Ah! But, but is there no sort of second chances? What does it say? But, but if, but, if... But if. Wonderful words. <laughs> but if... If a wicked man turns from all his sins which he has committed, mm. keeps all my statutes, and does what is lawful and right, he shall surely live. He shall not die. Ah, so in other words, it's possible to go from column A to column B. Mm. You have to stop doing the actions that go with column A, right? Isn't that what it says? Turns. If he turns from all his sins and starts doing the good <coughs> things in column B, keeps my statutes, <coughs> does that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. Go on. All his transgressions. None of the transgressions which he has committed shall be remembered against him. <coughs> yeah, they won't be remembered. Wow. So even though there are consequences of these evil acts, they're only consequences if you're active in them. <coughs> if you hmm. turn over to the other column, you start to get the blessings of the other column, and that other stuff is not going to be remembered. And why is that? Because of the righteousness which he has done, he shall live. Hmm. How does the Lord feel about it? Do I have any pleasure at all that the wicked should die, says the Lord God? And not that he should turn from his ways and live. So the Lord has structured this whole thing in a way that there's freedom. The Lord pleads with us to stop doing the left-hand stuff, do the right-hand stuff. And if you stop doing evil, all that stuff will, will go away. And it won't be remembered. And you'll uh, uh, then you come into what's called living. You know, you'll live. Uh, Okay, oh, let's see verse 26. When a righteous man turns away from his righteousness, commits iniquity, oh. and, and dies in it, it is because of the iniquity which he has done that he dies. Okay, so it's possible to go the other way too. Freedom, right? Even if you spent your whole life in column B doing good things, you could turn from that towards iniquity. Could happen to any of us and fall in this category and go through this spiritual death that it's talking about or you could be in the left hand column and turn from that as we hear in this next verse again when a wicked man turns away from the wickedness which he committed and does what is lawful and right he preserves himself alive because he considers and turns away from all the transgressions which he committed he shall surely live he shall not die I just there, there could be nothing clearer than that uh, it's a little challenging to know how to situate that in our life it, only in the sense that we don't see those consequences in, in our world you know like, like our, our world doesn't have that where people just suddenly keel over dead because they do an evil thing or and, and what does it mean that you live you know, what, what does living mean you know like everybody dies so, so so what's it talking about that if you do good you'll live if you do evil you'll die well, that's the same thing from Genesis but what is it talking about it's not it can't be literal. Let's go into Luke in the New Testament because it will be interesting to see the teaching of Jesus and especially after Jesus was resurrected which uh, was a very, very significant event um, but some people have uh, strange thoughts about exactly what the Lord did when he was in this world. Let's look at Luke chapter 9 verses 23 and 24. Okay. Then he said to them all, To them all, to everybody, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. So here's a sort of an if, right? If, if. you, if you want to come after me, here's what you have to do. 
You have to deny yourself, take up your cross daily, and follow me. And then go ahead and read the next verse. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. In the context of what we just read, losing <coughs> your life would mean losing that life of the evil acts that you were doing. Right? You had a whole life over here. If you lose that for the Lord's sake, then you'll find it. Then you'll find this life that's a much better life here in the right hand column. And look at Luke chapter 10. Very next chapter. We'll start at verse 25 and just read a few verses here. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, You don't have to do anything. I'm going to take away your sins. Don't do anything. He said to him, What is written in the law? What is your reading of it? Oh. So he answered and said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. Isn't that one of those commandments? That's a commandment, right? <coughs> with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Mm, loving the Lord, loving the neighbor. And what did Jesus say? He said to him, you have answered rightly. Do this and you will live. Ah, command and result. Do this. We've had a lot of if then. Now we get a command and result. Do this and you will live. Because they're connected to each other. But he hasn't changed the terms, has he? It's still life. Life is what you get in the right-hand column. Death is what you get in the left-hand column. He hasn't changed the terms at all there. And I just want to read in Luke 13, uh, verses 6 to 9. <coughs> he also spoke this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. And he came seeking fruit on it and found none. Oh. Then he said to the keeper of his vineyard, Look, for three years I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why does it use up the ground? Mm. But he answered and said to him, Sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and fertilize it. Aha. Uh -huh. Dig around it. It's never borne fruit. It's been three years. Uh, but let me dig around it and fertilize it. And... and if, if it bears fruit, well. If it bears fruit, well. But if not. But if not. After that, you can cut it down. After that, you can cut it down. Isn't that the same thing? <coughs> if it does well, that's great. Just like it says, if you do well, you know, that's good. If not, sin lies at the door. Isn't, it, isn't Jesus saying exactly the same thing we read in Genesis 4 there? Mm -hmm. Hmm. Now this is about a tree, but isn't it about repentance? Look, it was just saying in verse 3, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And in verse 5, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And then you have this little story about the tree. Isn't that about repenting? You know, dig around it, fertilize it, that's repentance. And if it bears fruit, that's good. Then you've switched over from the left column to the right column, and then you'll get the consequences of that. That's good. But if not, you'll cut it down. That, that's that's the death of that tree. That, that's the end of that tree. And uh, let's turn to the right to John. We've just got a few more of these. John chapter 8. Verses 31 and 32. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. If, okay, so there's an if, so if you abide in my word, or in the words of the old King James, if you continue in my word, they believed on him, but he said you, you need to continue. Mm. If you continue or you abide in my word, then you are my disciples, you are my indeed. disciples indeed. Yeah, that's an, if, that's an if then. So you, there's something you've got to do, you know, keep going with my word, mm. which is about repentance and everything. Then you're my disciples indeed. And... And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Mm. It's a little bit different than saying life and blessings, but it's comparable, isn't it? You'll know the truth, and the truth will, will make you free. If you continue, there's an if in there. Now, that's all before Jesus was crucified. So let's turn to the right to the epistle, Paul's epistle to the Romans. So you go through Acts, and you get to the Romans. Now, People say this is the constitution of faith alone Christianity, you know. 
And there's this amazing teaching. In effect, is it not true that the way that some people hold Christianity is that Jesus came into the world to sever the connection between evil and hell. He came into the world, the purpose of his life and his death in this world was to sever this connection between the lower box on the left and the upper box on the left, between evil acts and and mm -hmm. death and curse. Mm -hmm. He came into the world to take on himself the condemnation of the law, to take that away, because there's nothing we can do. We can't help sinning. So we have to just believe in Jesus, and he will give us heaven even though we were sinful. Isn't that tantamount to saying that the purpose of Jesus' coming into this world was to sever the connection between evil actions mm -hmm. and their consequences? That you could do evil actions... But believe in Jesus and you will get heaven. You will get life and blessings. That the actual purpose that Jesus came into this world, they say, was to sever that connection. And that's what he did. He came into this world to sever that connection. He took that condemnation on himself. We're no longer under the law. We're under grace now. All you have to do is believe. Now, believing is important. You've got to believe in order to be in the club. But you don't have to live well anymore. You don't have to repent. I mean, this is openly taught. The Ten Commandments are done away with. This is openly taught. You don't have to follow the Ten Commandments anymore. They even say that if someone's committing adultery, they say, you know, one of the things that they say is that if, if someone's commi committing adultery, their spouse needs to forgive them. You know, that's what's needed. Or if, if someone's committing adultery, they say, Jesus died for that. That's what Jesus died for. He came into the world so that I could commit adultery without consequence. Jesus came into the world to sever the connection, the connection that's so clearly taught in Scripture up to this point that we're at now, between evil actions and this debt. He took away that curse. He took away the debt so that now that you can live an evil life and you can go to heaven. This is really amazing to me. But this is what's taught. It's amazing. But this is what it boils down to. This is what, how people interpret Jesus' life. He came into this world in order to protect you know, sinners from the consequence of, of their sin. It's amazing. So let's see if this is what Paul teaches. Look at Romans chapter 6, because this is definitely after the resurrection. You know? Because the way that this is taught, people say, oh yeah, you got all that repentance stuff and all that if, then in the Old Testament. But when Jesus died on the cross, whole new ball game. We're not talking about, we're not talking about evil acts lead to death and good acts lead to life. We're not talking about that anymore. Jesus took care of all that. That was nailed to the cross, you know. So let's have a look at what Paul says here. Romans chapter 6, picking up at the 15th verse. Hmm. The first one was pretty good. What yeah. then... <laughs> What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? Certainly not. Certainly not. Or in the old King James, God forbid. Ah. Yeah. Should we sin because we're not? No, we shouldn't be sinning. Oh, Paul says you shouldn't sin. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, go on. What do you say, Paul? Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one's slaves whom you obey? Yes, Whether right? Do you, see what he, do you see what he's saying? Not exactly. Don't you realize <laughs> that whomever or whatever you devote your whole self to as a slave, you are the mm -hmm. slave of that. Mm -hmm. That person, that thing, whatever it is. You know, if you live for evil, you are the slave of evil. If you live for good, you are a servant of what is, of what is good. Uh, don't you realize that whatever you yield yourself to to obey, you're the servant of that thing. And what are the choices there? Whether of sin leading to death. What? No, 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 wait, 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 wait. We got the wrong Paul. There must be a translation error or something like that. <coughs> Do you mean, Paul, that sin leads to death? Because that's what the Old Testament said. Evil actions lead to death. Okay, go on. 
whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. Oh, so you don't get a righteousness by just believing in Jesus. You get righteousness by obeying and not being sinful. Right? Isn't that what that says? Mm-hmm. Mm, okay, interesting. But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin... You were. You used to be. You, you were, were slaves of sin. Yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. Aha! You see, you have to obey the doctrine from the heart. This is different than just saying believe. You have to obey it. You have to do it. And you have not just go through the motions. Obey it from the heart. You've got to obey it from the heart. Go on. And what happened as a result of obeying that doctrine from the heart that was delivered to you? And having been set free from sin, uh -huh. you became slaves of righteousness. Yes. Okay. So when you stopped doing that stuff, you obeyed from the heart the teaching that was given to you then you slipped over to the right-hand column and you became slaves of righteousness and you were free from sin. Mm. That's how you get free from sin. You have to change your behavior, right? You have to get away from the behavior. Jesus didn't magically take care of that on the cross. Go on. I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness, and of lawlessness leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. Oh, well, I feel like Paul is almost talking about two different columns here. It's almost as if you had a column on the left that was about uncleanness and lawlessness leading to more lawlessness, which leads to death, and some right-hand column that talked about being righteous and becoming holy. You'd almost get that sense from it, wouldn't you? Go on. I like this statement. See if you can track what this is saying. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. Yeah, in the Old King James, you were free from righteousness. Like, when you were a slave of sin, it, you weren't much bothered by righteousness, were you? The argument being that when you're slaves of righteousness, you won't be much bothered by sin. Hmm. They're opposites, right? When you were slaves of sin... Righteousness was, was not uh, on the menu. You know, it, it, it wasn't something that was affecting you much. But conversely, if you go over to the right-hand column, you know, sin won't be bothering you anymore. Go on. What fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? I love that question. What fruit? What fruit did that bear, that crazy life that you used to lead? What, what fruit did that bear? those things that you're now ashamed of. What benefit did that have? What, what good did that do others and, and yourself? The things you're now ashamed of. For? For the end of those things is death. The end of those things is death. Wait a minute. It almost sounds as though Paul hasn't changed the message at all. Almost as if the same rules apply after Jesus' resurrection as before. Go on. But now, having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God... You see, you had to be set free from sin and then to become a slave of God because those things are not compatible with each other. They're two different columns. You, you're free to choose one or the other, but things go together in each of those columns. Go on. You have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life. What? You mean that the way that I live my life has an impact on my everlasting, my eternal situation? It's not just a function of that I have to believe in Jesus no matter how I live. I actually have to change the way I'm living, stop sinning, and become righteous, doing righteous things that lead to holiness? Tell me more about that. For the wages of sin is death. Oh, that's a striking phrase. I've never seen that on a billboard. <laughs> but the, the wages of sin wait a minute the wages of sin are you saying Paul that sin is ineluctably connected with death is that what you're saying the wages of sin this just goes together what sin earns you what fruit does it give you it gives you death well what about the other side what about the other column 
But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Mm, the gift of God. It's a gift. Because you can't just earn it or fabricate it yourself. And yet it's a gift that you have to do something to get. Right? Mm -hmm. It's a gift that you have to do something to get. You have to obey from the heart the teaching that you've been given. No one can do that for you. And that's what helps you get free of sin and be a slave of righteousness and, and so on. Good, good. How about Romans chapter 8? We'll just read one verse in here. Verse 13. For if you live according to the if, flesh... If you live after, according to the flesh... You will die. Oh, wait a minute, Paul. What are you... What? If you... Just so are you saying if you do evil acts according to the desires of your flesh and so on... You shall die, but, but if, if and but, but, column B, if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. You will live. Wait a minute, that teaching is not a lick different from the Old Testament. That's the same thing. This is Romans. This is supposed to be the constitution of faith alone. What has happened? I'm worried about the structure of Christianity. <laughs> if through the Spirit you mortify the deeds of the body. Now, wait a minute. Why do I have to mortify the deeds of the body? Jesus died on the cross for that. I don't have to mortify the deeds of my body. I don't have to stop committing adultery. I don't have to stop having murderous thoughts about people or stealing or bearing false witness or coveting. You know, I don't have to stop that. Jesus died for that. I thought I didn't have to stop it. But Paul is saying, if, he's saying too, isn't he saying this chart? Couldn't you just write his words right on this chart? If you live after the flesh, ineluctable consequence, you shall die, whatever that means. But if through the Spirit, in other words, with the help of the Lord, you mortify the deeds of the body, in other words, you turn away from those sinful things you've been doing, you shall live life and blessings from good actions. Wait a minute, Paul was supposed to be the poster child. What's was this? Paul is in the Romans. What's going on? Okay, turn to the right. Let's go to the book of Revelation. Also written after Jesus was resurrected. And let's look at chapter 21. And let's just read verses 7 and 8 in there real quick. Of the millions of things we could read. Mm -hmm. He who overcomes shall inherit all things. Okay. Couldn't you rephrase, re rephrase that as an if? If? Like, if you overcome, and what are you overcoming? The, the deeds of the flesh, right? The lusts of the flesh or whatever. You know, if you overcome, you will inherit all things, right? It's another way of saying if then, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Oh, well, that's a consequence, okay? But. But. Oh, but. So there's an impl implied if, and a then, and then a but. And then an implied if. <laughs> <laughs> if, uh, but the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Interesting. <laughs> so, that does sound like it's bad to be a whoremonger. <laughs> I get the impression that murderers don't fare so well, you know, and liars and idolaters and so forth. And isn't it interesting? It gives you that same, sa it says it's the second death, right? It says that those evil acts lead to a death, and yet it says they will have their part, as if their consciousness continues, even though they're in something called death. Hmm. That's been running all, all, all through the, this discourse this evening, isn't it? That you keep going, right? You have your part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death, and that is a result of not overcoming. In other words, being, being dragged down by those evil things. And 22, verses 14 and 15. Blessed are those who do his commandments. Oh, blessed are those. So this is a different way of saying the same thing, isn't it? Like, if you do the commandments, then you will be blessed. You'll get blessings, life and blessings. And what will those blessings be like? 
that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. Wow, the right to the tree of life. You'll get So this goes all the way back to Genesis, doesn't it? The tree of life. You have the right to the tree of life. That was blocked by the, by the guardian angels. But if you do his commandments, you'll be let back into Eden. You'll, be, you'll have a right to the tree of life and what? But, uh, oh, and enter through the gates into the city. But, you want me to keep going? Yes, please. Outside. But, there's always a but. Outside, outside so who's outside? Are dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. Hmm. So doesn't that sound again? Doesn't that sound again like you probably shouldn't murder people? Or love and make a lie and so on. Because if you do his commandments, you stop doing those things and then you get into the column and you get life. But if you don't do them, you're, uh, you're outside of the city. Darn it. I wish there was another, maybe there's another God up there. Or maybe there's another revelation. Unfortunately, I think this is the message of the whole of Scripture. And so it's quite amazing that it's been twisted... Where do you think that came from? Do you think heaven sent a message into this world saying that Jesus came into the world in order to sever the connection between evil and its consequence? Do you think that message came down from heaven? Do you think an angel came flapping down and said, Oh, I, this just in. Jesus came into the world to sever the consequence from doing evil so that you can do it with impunity and you're covered as long as you believe in Jesus. Do you think that was an angel that came down from heaven and said that? Mm. Or do you think, or does that sound, does that smell, do you smell any sulfur? <laughs> does, that, does that have the whiff of hell in that teaching? That the connection is severed? Isn't this the main thing the Lord sets up? He says, look, I've given you freedom. And we say, well, the freedom I want is I want to have evil acts from column A and life and blessings from column B. That's what I would like. And the Lord says, well, you're welcome to have evil acts. Go ahead. You need to know that they are ineluctably tied to death and curses. If you would like to have life and blessings, you need to lay those evil acts aside and come over here and do good things. And then you will have those life and blessings. Well, the people don't really believe that they can kill and be really mean and get to heaven too, they? They do. It's amazing. They, they actually do. This is actually taught. This is actually taught. And, and, and celebrated. And, and um, it, it's amazing. Absolutely amazing. Now, one thing, this is just sort of a philosophical point, but uh, one thing I've never heard anybody argue is that Jesus came into the world to sever the right-hand connection. I've never heard anybody say that Jesus came into the world in order to disconnect good actions from going to heaven so that you can live a good life and go to hell since Jesus came into the world. You now have the option of living a good, exemplary life full of love in your heart for God and your neighbor, and you still have the opportunity to go to hell. I don't hear anybody selling that point. It's interesting, isn't it? It only seems to go the other way. Everybody seems to want to get into heaven, but they seem to want to get into heaven. Okay, so the good probably still go to heaven, but Jesus came into the world to make it possible for the evil to go to heaven too. And that's the wonderful thing that he did. He, he gave that cloak of his merit so that, you know, God the Father won't see the terrible things that you did. You, they'll just see the justice and merit of Jesus and the suffering of what he went through. And you'll be able to sneak under that cloak right into heaven and, and, and uh, get in there and, and there'll be no consequences for your actions, even though scripture from one end to the other says that that's not how it works. Okay, now what about this business? Though? What about the... Yes. My well, I just do know someone that thinks I'm going to hell because I don't believe that the blood of Jesus is saving me. So that is tantamount to the same thing. That I could be a good I, person. I guess so. You could be a good person and because you don't have the belief, you're going to go to hell. Right. Along with Gandhi and a lot of other exactly. wonderful people. Yes, yeah. right. That's right. It doesn't matter how good I you mean, are. I mean, not that I'm... If you don't believe in Jesus, you're going to hell. <coughs> That's right. 
<coughs> babies that are not baptized as Christian will go to hell and so on. That's true. That's true. There is a version of that. That's, not, that's, that's yeah, true. not even that I don't believe in Jesus, but that I don't believe that Jesus' blood is why I'm going to heaven. Yeah, okay. You believe in Jesus, but not in the right way. Uh, right. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's right. Yeah, you, th that's probably true. Um, <laughs> so, now, it is true, isn't it? And it, it, it is true that we don't see that, you know, to repeat myself a little bit, it's not the case that when you decide to go through some repentance in this world and you turn toward the Lord and you want to give your life to the Lord, that your life automatically gets better in every material way. One of the things that I've been thinking about this week in, in reflecting on this Bible study is the amazing teaching of the prosperity gospel, which is that if you believe in Jesus, money will come flowing in. If you give money to the pastor, you will get ten times as much back from the Lord. The Lord can take care of your little mortgage problem. He can give you a job, you know. And uh, it's amazing teaching. Because what that would mean is that 100% of the wealthy people in the world are good Christians. And 100% of the poor people are evil. You know, it, and that if you were born into poverty... And then what? Like you couldn't be born into poverty if that was true because you haven't even done anything yet and you're already poor. You know, it doesn't make sense. Or if you're born into wealth, the moment you're born, you already have money. Like, well, how could wealth be a direct result of your relationship with Jesus if you're three months old and you don't have a relationship with Jesus yet? You don't even know English, you know, or any language. Uh, it, it doesn't make sense, you know. And yet this is taught a lot. It's very, very attractive, you know, form of ridiculous Christianity uh, that, that if you are doing it right, you will get money. And part of the evidence for this is that the preacher is getting a ton of money. You know, the preacher is doing very, very well. Private jet, million dollars a week coming in in the basket and so on. And so you think, yes, it must be true. I mean, look at the preacher. He's rolling in dough. He must have a fabulous relationship with the Lord. Uh, but I don't think that's necessarily the case. You know? I, I, I don't think that's necessarily the case. I don't think that's good teaching. That's mistaking something spiritual for something physical. It is not true in our world. And it's very good that it's not true. Let me try to explain. It's not true in our world that doing good things automatically gives you physical blessings. And if you do the thought experiment and think of what kind of world we would live in if that were true... Why would you, would you ever genuinely do anything good? Would you ever do anything good for the right reasons? You know, it literally, if every single time you did something nice, you went home and your bank account went up a hundred bucks or something, you know, and every time you did something nasty or you'd snap somebody's head off or something, your, your account went down $200 or something, well, you would, how would, how would you... How would you or the Lord or anybody know whether you were doing something for the finances or, or whether you, know, you were doing it for genuine reasons? It, it has to be in this world that is disconnected. We would know enough. The Lord has given us the law of gravity and things like you know, what you eat or drink and so on that give us a sense of consequences. But there are a lot of things in this world where living morally doesn't necessarily just have automatically fabulous consequences. There, you know, there, it does some good things for you and some bad things. There, there, there are people in the world who've, who've uh, given themselves to the Lord and, and uh, they, they had, you know, the, their partner left them or, or uh, you know, or they lose a job or, or they lose everything or, or whatever. You know, this kind of thing happens and the New Testament talks about it. It's amazing that the prosperity gospel gets away with saying that that doesn't happen. Because uh, it does. And, and the Lord says, in the world you will have trouble. He almost guarantees it. Um, uh, so it's not true that you just believe in the Lord and all this material wealth and blessing will come your way. It, it, just, it, does, it doesn't work that way. That's, that's obviously not the way that it works. But so then people look at that and they say, well, then I doubt Scripture. Because Scripture says, if I do good things, my cattle will increase and I'll get rain and everything's going to be fabulous. I'm going to be healthy and live, you know, and, and if I do evil, uh, then I won't. Uh, everything will dwindle and there'll be no rain and, and, and I'll be in debt and, and all that. And yet it doesn't happen that way. And so I think some people doubt Scripture because they just say, well, that's like a, 
that's like a children's story. It's, it's just it's just something to try to get you to be good by giving you some false hope of like you'll get this reward if you do this thing. But what does it say? It says in Matthew, uh, "Great is your reward." Where? Where it says, "Great is your reward." Where? Where does it say, "Great is in your heaven. reward in heaven"? It says, "Oh, great is your reward in heaven." It says, "In the world you will have trouble." Great is your reward in heaven, it says. Oh, so what if all this is all those curses and blessings we 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 read about are true in the spiritual world, in the afterlife? What if they're even you know Swedenborg says Swedenborg's claim, as I talked about last week, is that he went to the afterlife and he saw people. He saw people he knew, and and lots of people in the spiritual world, and saw how their lives turned out when they went to the other side, and what he says is that it's literally true in the other world that people who are rich in wisdom and love are wealthy in the spiritual world. And people who are not rich in, in, in love and wisdom are impoverished in the spiritual world. It's literally true that hell looks like a desert, he says. It, it, hardly anything grows there. Thorns and brambles or nothing but sand and so on like that. If you're in hell, it literally doesn't rain. Or not nearly enough to support vegetation. And that in heaven, it's literally a garden of Eden. Lush rivers and gardens, because that's what intelligence and wisdom and love correspond to. You know, beautiful mountains and, and, and that all those blessings and those curses, they're, they're not true in this world. And it's important that they're not. Not literally, not in an external way. Not your external literal sheep. Not your external literal cattle. Or your knee, you know, whether it has a boil on it or not. It's not talking about your physical knee or your physical sheep or whatever. But what if that's true in the spiritual world? That actually following the Lord's commandments is inexorably tied to this word life. And I don't know exactly what that word life means, but I think it's probably desirable. I think it's something good. I think it probably has to do with creativity. It probably has to do with love and wisdom flowing into you. It probably has to do with the blessing of having a relatively small ego, a sense of the blessings of the Lord, a love for others, a desire for them to do better than you are doing yourself, that kind of, you know, life. Uh, life. And the death is this miserable, wretched life of just craving something that's bad for you and bad for other people, and you either do it, and Swedenborg says uh, in a very powerful statement that in the spiritual world, uh, the deed and its consequence are one. They are the same thing. It's not that you arbitrarily get punished. In this world, you can do lots of bad things and, and face no punishment or even get you know, promoted or get wealthy or whatever. But in the spiritual world, your actions and the consequences are, are one. They are the same thing. And so that evil act has punishment within it. I tried to think of an analogy of this and I didn't, didn't do very well, but it, it's like because the evil act, because you're not following the commandments of the Lord, you deprive yourself of that protection and the company of the angels. You turn your back on the Lord. And then you simply are exposed to evil spirits. You're just exposed to evil spirits. You're not protected in the same way. And so there's a consequence that just automatically comes from that, of the company that you keep, the spiritual company that you keep with what you do. In our world, these things are not necessarily directly connected. But even in our spirits while we're living this world, some of this is true. It's not true that repenting um, always makes your heart full of joy and puts a smile on your face. You know, uh, that's not true. Jesus was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, it says. Uh, it, it's hard to go through this world. It speaks in the Psalms about sowing, you know, weeping while you're sowing. And then, and then you're rejoicing when you gather your sheaves in and everything. While we're in this world, we're sowing and there's a lot of weeping that goes on in this world. That's why it says in the book of Revelation, the Lord will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Yeah, there's lots of tears along the way. 
uh, it's not that just doing good things in this world will automatically make you happy and good looking and rich and all that. Uh, but there are little blessings that start to filter in. And what does the scripture say? That you're laying up treasures for yourself in heaven. Not here, but in heaven you're laying up treasures. You may not even know those things are there. But you're laying up treasures for yourself in heaven. And when you do evil things, you may not feel a consequence here. But Swedenborg has some chilling statement about how uh, the, the bonds of evil... Uh, from being titillating in this world become like galling chains. You know, you, you, I think of that image of, um, you know, Scrooge and, the, and his partner who comes back and, it, you know, they, these chains that I wear, I forged in life. And, uh, you know, he's, he, he's wearing uh, what he did and his, his self-centered life is what he's, what he's wearing with him. And, and the person we read about last time, and the rich man and Lazarus, who wants to warn his brothers you know, to repent. Because when you get to the other side, you see, oh, Lazarus is doing great. The rich man is not doing well. There turns out to be consequences. While the rich man was in this world, he was faring sensuously every day and, and wearing purple and fine linen and all that. And, and, and Lazarus was full of sores. But Lazarus was good. And he went to the bosom of Abraham. He was filled with life and blessings and good things after death. And uh, this evil has consequences uh, for the rich man after death uh, that he can't um, that he can't escape because they're they're written in his heart and everything. Um, every evil action, if you could open it up, actually has hell inside. And every good action, if you could open it up, if you could see with your spiritual eyes, it has heaven inside it. It is a little heaven and a little hell. So you can't get the hell out of the evil act. Not even Jesus coming into this world and dying on the cross can get the hell out of evil. That's what evil is. Evil's not called evil arbitrarily. It's called evil because it's really bad. <laughs> because it's bad for you. It's bad for other people. It just is bad. And good is good, not because God wants you to do that because he's funny that way. Uh, good is good. Good is good for you, and it's good for other people. It's actually good. And those things have the heaven and the hell within them. And after we die, we come into this, we come into this if-then that Scripture talks about. Scripture is always much more about the spiritual world than it is about this world. After we die, we come more fully into the consequences of the choices that we made. We may deny that we made choices or we'd say we couldn't help it, you know, or whatever. But the Lord gave us freedom, all the freedom in the world. And he just says, do whatever you want. Swedenborg has this story about people who go to the other world and they say to angels, what should we be doing? And the angel says to them, do whatever you want. Just know that people who do this go to hell, and people who do this go to heaven. That's what the Lord Amen. laid on my heart. Thank you, friends. Let's close with a prayer. Oops. Oh, Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, you are the living word you bowed the heavens and came down, O oh Lord. We thank you for coming into this world, for walking the path of repentance, laying aside hereditary evil, showing us the way, Lord. You came into this world to relieve us from sin. You did not do that by some magic act of absolving all evil forever or taking away the consequences but by strengthening yourself so that you can be the Savior forever, able to save us to the uttermost when we turn ourselves to you. You have power over the hells. You know the recipe. You know the way from hell to heaven. We turn to you, Lord, and we seek your guidance and your help in walking that path. We love the idea of these consequences that come if we follow you. 
Our Father, who art in the heavens, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so upon the earth. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let's keep repenting, friends. Let's keep working on that repentance.